Hello everyone. Welcome to this webinar about the secondary schools. And uh, before we start, I would like to know, can you see me well and hear me well? Could you please answer in the, the chat? Oh, I see some of you have already found me. Great. Hi, John. Nice to see you here. Hi, James. Hi, Noor. OK, perfect. So this works well. So this is about the Netherlands. Uh, I see that a lot of you live in uh, Amsterdam. In February, I will give another presentation and then specifically about the secondary schools in Amsterdam, because every city has its own policies. It's uh, a bit confusing. Tonight, we'll mostly talk about uh, secondary schools in general, so in, uh, in the Netherlands overall. Towards the end, we'll zoom in a little bit to uh, the Amsterdam schools because the majority of you uh, lives there. And then for the people who don't live in Amsterdam, they can just uh, leave if they want to and they don't miss much. Uh, afterwards, I will send a presentation to you, the PowerPoint and also the um, recording. A short introduction. Uh, so my name is Annabeth van Mameren. Uh, since 10 years, I have my own business, new to nl And I started that because of um, out of interest. Uh, my mother has been um, a teacher and later coordinator for uh, newcomer children and later for adults who uh, had to learn Dutch before they could work in the Netherlands. So we always talked about education and uh, and that's uh, very interesting to me. I uh, worked for uh, bigger companies like uh, Canon, uh, so I know how the corporate world looks like more or less. I worked for some uh, smaller companies, so uh, for that I also I got to do a lot of different tasks. So uh, when I started my own business, that was a lot of things I had already done before. I've lived in uh, Italy. I uh, studied organizational psychology in, uh, the at the University of Groningen. Then I did an internship about intercultural conflicts at work. And then I did another internship at the uh, University of Turin. And in total, I stayed there for two and a half years. I also worked there. So I had my share of intercultural conflicts there myself. And I'm married to an um, American. We have two sons. Uh, they grow up bilingual. Uh, you can see them here in the picture. They, that's a few years ago. They are uh, 13 and 11 now. And this is in Philadelphia, where my uh, in-laws uh, come from. So that's very short about me, but I don't think uh, that's what you came here for tonight. So we'll, um, we'll talk about a lot of other things. This is the agenda. So first we'll talk about the timeline of group eight. So most of your children are in group eight, some in uh, group seven. And uh, but it's very good to already start now so you know what's uh, going to happen. Yeah, you will see a lot of abbreviations uh, in the coming period. Uh, so VMBL, HAFA, VWO. It's very important that you understand which is which. So we'll talk about that too. Then what type of professions can be done after which type of education. Then we we'll zoom into the schools. Uh, so what are the differences and the similarities between the schools? What to look for in a school? And that's very personal. So there's no ranking of schools. So you cannot say this is a good school and that is a bad school. It really depends on, uh, yeah, on what you want for your child and what your child wants. That's also very important. I'll be talking a little bit about the Amsterdam Lottery. And after that, you can ask your questions. And I have some, um, some resources that you could use for more information. So it's a um, fully packed uh, agenda. And um, I expect to finish around 9.30. But that also depends on your questions, of course. The timeline of Group 8. So a lot is happening in this period. Uh, this weekend is the Schola Arena. Maybe you've already signed up for that. Uh, that's a school fair where practically all schools of Amsterdam, so the secondary schools that is, they uh, have a stand at the fair in, um, yeah, it used to be in the Amsterdam Arena, uh, the Johan Cruijff Arena, but this year it's in North in the Kromhout Hall. 
So that's a very good starting point. So you can see all the schools and maybe there are some new schools you have never heard of. Uh, you can already make a shift of schools that you like and don't like. Uh, but that's not the only thing. So you should also visit them during the open days. And the open days are in January or February. And some open days you have to sign up in advance. So make sure to check them. And um, I will also share you um, my schedule that I made uh, to visit with my child because my younger son is also in uh, group eight. And, um, and be prepared. It's a lot of work. So don't underestimate this period. So for you'll see later for um, in Amsterdam for HAVA and VWO, you need to list 12 schools. So you really want to visit all those schools. And for uh, VMBOT, you visit six. You have to list six schools and for uh, VMBO B and K, four schools. So you don't want your child to end up at a school you have never visited before. So take this very serious. And uh, some schools, they also have what they call a leisure middag, and you should see that as a trial class. I wouldn't drag your child to all the trial classes because uh, they will not enjoy that. I can guarantee that. So the schools that you think would be suitable for your child, maybe they want to do a trial class there. Just to get an idea of how does a lesson work? Um, how do the teachers teach? So I think that's... Uh, that's important that they have some experience in that area. So I would say save the leisure middag for maybe three or four schools. That's uh, that's what my plan is, at least. Um, then the next on the program is the uh, preliminary advice or in Dutch, the voorlopig advies. And a lot has, has changed in this respect. So when someone explains you how things went in the previous years, um, it's not the same anymore. So don't listen too much to old stories. And what has changed is that now the, the pre-advice, as they call it, is between the 10th and the 31st of January. And the, the advice, is based on uh, the test results from group six to uh, group eight, but also the child's uh, attitude, motivation, interest, intelligence, study skills, ambition. So they look at the child as a whole. And then they will give you an advice. And it's funny, um, I asked in the questions um, to register for this webinar. So do you already know about your child's advice? And some of you didn't get that question, but when someone asks about the advice, they mean the recommendation of the teacher. So when someone asks uh, what kind of advice will your child get, then you say VMBO or HAFO or VWO or we don't know yet or combination of the above. Or, um, so that's the answer to that question. And so you will get a pre-advice uh, in the uh, before the end of January. What has also changed is that uh, they will take the test that was previously called the end test, but now it's called the transition test. So Dorstrom toots in Dutch. And that is a test that is uh, uh, basically about um, Dutch language. So uh, grammar, spelling, comprehensive reading is very important and math. Uh, previously, they also asked for um, world orientation and study skills, but yeah, the transition test is new, so they haven't been published yet, but it sounds like it will be more heavily based on Dutch and math and less on the other subjects. But yeah, that's not completely sure yet. And then after the test, um, the, the students will get their final advice. And that will be before the 24th of March. So what's also different is that this applies to the whole country. So previously, every city town had a different procedure. In Amsterdam and some other cities, there's a lottery. In some places, most places actually, there's not. Um, and everyone had their own timing. So now it's the same for the whole country. And what's also different is that uh, previously, this 
the children made a test. So what's then called the uh, end test after the final advice. And that this make a difference for some of the students because um, the if the test results are higher than the teacher's advice, then the final advice can be hired. So that's very nice. If the test results are lower than the teacher's advice, then the teacher's advice stays, so it will not go down. But then when there was a lottery, like in Amsterdam, the schools, some of the schools were already full. So you get a high advice, but there's no place anymore. And that was really unfair to the students who really worked hard for the test. So now first uh, they take the, the transition test and then follows the final advice. So the teacher will include the test results in the final advice, but still the recommendation of the teacher is leading. So the final advice cannot be lower than the pre-advice. Uh, up to last year, the pre-advice already came in group seven. So now it's mid group eight. So also that has changed. So the children have more, more time to develop and to show what they're capable of. But as a consequence, it's really one thing after the other thing. So it will be very busy. And then, um, so for all uh, cities and towns, they have uh, the same application period. So that between the 25th and the 31st of March. And for a lot of places, um, you apply for school and you get a place there and then you're done. And in uh, places like Amsterdam, where there's a lottery, then the outcome will be on the 17th of April. So you have to wait until then, and then you know where your child will get a place. So this timeline is very important to um, to keep in mind, and uh, so you know what's uh, coming up. Um, this is uh, about uh, the advice. Um, so it's uh, also common that the children get a double advice, and that means it's uh, VMBOT slash HAFO or HAFO slash VWO. So it's a bit like, yeah, depending on how the child develops, they could either go in this direction or that direction. Um, but that really depends on, uh, on the child, how, uh, how the teacher sees them. And like I said, it's uh, a bit subjective what the teacher looks at. And this might be very different from what you're used to. And, um, but in the end, the uh, recommendation from the teacher is more important than the transition test. So some of the uh, some of you asked, uh, do you need to practice for the transition test? Um, well, if you want to, you can, of course, but um, it is an aptitude test. So they look at what a child has learned in the past years in school. It's not an exam. You cannot pass or fail the test. And like I said, the teacher's recommendation is more important. So you could practice for the test, but then not specifically to pass the test, but more like um, maybe your child, especially if uh, Dutch is not their native language, maybe they still struggle a bit with comprehensive reading. So then you could practice with reading and vocabulary, learn new words, um, talk about a lot of concepts uh, that are more difficult in your language and then find a translation in Dutch. Also, math is uh, often very language based in the Netherlands, so you can practice those questions. And it's also about uh, yeah, study skills in general. So uh, does your child finish their homework in time? Do they plan ahead? Do they understand that they have to start early if there's a bigger task and that they can cut it up into smaller pieces? Um, are they in time at school in do they ask questions if they don't understand? Are they disrupting the class? Are they behaving well? So all those things the teacher will look at. And um, and they base the final 
advice on that. Um, so uh, VWO is, um, like we will see later, consists of two streams to <laughs> make it even more difficult. So Ateneum and Gymnasium, but a child gets VWO advice, there's no Gymnasium advice. So um, I know of some parents, they ask for Gymnasium advice because they thought their child should really go there, but that does not exist. So yeah, the teacher cannot give that. Um, so like I said, if the test results of the transition test are higher than the teacher's recommendation, then um, the final advice can be hired. Uh, that was already the case previously, but now they have to explain much more if the teacher decides not to hire the advice. So only if they think it's really a benefit for the child to stay at a lower level, that could happen, but in reality, I don't think that will be the case so much anymore. So that's also um, important to know. Um, and then also um, maybe applies to some of you. Uh, children who have lived less than four years in the Netherlands, they don't need to take the test. They can, but they don't have to. So advantage of taking the transition test is to show at what level they are, what they still have difficulty with, what they should practice, and what goes well, of course. But the teacher may not base the final advice on the outcome of the test if the child has lived uh, less than four years in the Netherlands. So if that is the case, then you should talk with the teacher before the transition test and decide will your child take it or not? And what are the consequences of the outcome? So how will that be interpreted? So it can be that, OK, child, considering a few years that they've been here, they performed well and we expect it will be better. Uh, so we give a higher advice than what shows from the test now because we see potential. So that, that could be uh, one of the uh, outcomes. Um, some parents, especially international parents, they uh, are afraid that this test and the advice will decide the rest of their child's life. Um, that is not the case. You should see it as um, the door to the secondary school where the child enters, but it doesn't mean that they will also leave the school through the same door. So a lot of schools, they have what they call a bridge class, a brug class in Dutch, and there they combine multiple levels in the same class. So it's common to have a, a brug class for the first year, but more and more schools have a combined class for two or three years. So especially if your child got a double advice, if, if you think oh, they can still develop, they can grow into a higher level, then I would definitely recommend to go to um, a school that has this combined brug class. And then it's also important to know that with a diploma from one level, you can move up to the next level. Um, it's not easy, it takes uh, motivation and determination, but if a child really wants to get there, there's always a way. Also, when a child is uh, adult by the time when they are uh, 21 or older, they can also take uh, what's called a colloquium doctum, and that is the entry exam for university, and then they just look at the exam results and not at uh, at any school or education or diplomas or anything. So if you really want to go to university, then that could be a way to. So there's a lot of different uh, roads that lead to Rome. And um, and it also yeah depends on the child. And that I can show in this uh, diagram is from uh, Wikipedia. Uh, so there's three different levels, the VMBO, HAFO, VWO. You see those arrows, so what I said after uh, one with one diploma, you can move to the next level. So uh, VMBO is uh, vocational education that takes four years. Then you could go to MBO, 
So to learn for a profession, or you can go to the fourth year of HAFO. So in that sense, you lose a year, but yeah, the, the program is different. And uh, so you need to get that year to catch up. And from the fifth year of HAFO, you can go to HBO, which is University of Applied Sciences. Or you can go to the fifth year of BWO, and after that you can go to Research University. So after MBO, you can go to HBO, after HBO, so you could do your bachelor's at HBO and then master's at uh, Research University. Some HBO studies also have a master's, so there's a lot of different crossovers. And some arrows they forgot, because there's also students after VWO who go to HAFO or from HAFO, to, uh, sorry, to HBO or from HAFO to MBO. So when they want to do something more practical, uh, which is not available at the level they uh, they were moving towards. So also that happens. So in the end, if you look at the overall population, then 52% uh, of, uh, of men, sorry, 61% uh, of women have um, uh, tertiary education qualification, which is higher than the uh, OECD average of uh, most countries in the world. So in the end, they get there. But the idea is that for every child, there's a suitable level that uh, follows their interests and that is at the level they are capable of. So there's not that much competition. There is some, but it's not that a child who's maybe not that academic that they are competing all the time against other uh, students who are much more academic or that they know they always have lower grades. So they all perform at their own level and their own interest. And in that way, it, the idea is, it doesn't always work like that, of course, but the idea is that they um, follow their interests, get a diploma, and with that diploma, they can get a good job. So the diplomas, they are very valuable. And now with a shortage of almost uh, everything, um, the MBO uh, professions, they are very much in need. Which professions they are, we'll, uh, we'll see uh, next. Um, but that is the idea. Um, yeah. Like I said, it doesn't always go well. So it's important to keep track of that and also talk regularly with the teacher and in secondary school with the mentor. How that works, we'll talk about later. Uh, I've made a video about the different uh, types of secondary school. So uh, when you click on this link, then uh, you will get to the YouTube video that explains also uh, in short how the system works. Um, I didn't update it yet, so it doesn't talk about the transition test and uh, those other things that have changed yet. So uh, what I told you here in this presentation, that is uh, how it works now. Now, if we zoom in a little bit more into the different levels of uh, secondary school, then we start with VMBO. And that is um, Preparatory Secondary Vocational Education. So like I said, it takes uh, four years and they prepare for senior secondary vocational education. So uh, all children are obliged to attend school until they are 16 or no, and have a diploma. And uh, so that can be a diploma for a minimum of HAFO, VWO or MBO level two, there's different levels. So after VMBO, they still have to go to um, to MBO or to HAFO to, and then they are not obliged to go to school anymore. So that's important to uh, realize. And um, there's four different levels within <laughs> VMBO, so that makes it more complicated. Uh, so there's uh, the basic vocational training, and uh, that's called basis in Dutch. Then there's cadre, which is more like framework training. The mixed training that is um, 
yeah, it's phasing out actually. So um, it's more theoretical, so VMBO T. So I don't think your children will get a VMBO G because yeah, that's uh, that's not very current anymore. Um, and then, uh, so apart from the different type of training, so some trainings are more theoretical and others are more uh, practical and with more internships or more hours that they study in schools, so also depending on what the students like and what they're capable of. And then they also have to choose a sector in which they want to specialize, and that's especially for the, the later years. So that can be um, for VMBOT, uh, technical, agriculture, economics, and care and welfare. You will sometimes see the term MAFO, and that is the old name of VMBOT. So that's the same thing, but they use both names still. And then there's more choices to make for the VMBO um, basis and cadre. And um, so most schools, they offer uh, all the profiles and all, all the sectors, but some are more specialized in some sectors than others. So especially for VMBO, it's important to understand what your child is interested in and then see if they offer that at a specific school. So you have some uh, smaller VMBO schools that cannot offer all the subjects or all the tracks or you have some specialized schools uh, for art or music, for example, and then they don't offer maybe agriculture or um, care and welfare. So that's something to uh, to check as well. Just get a sip of water. So the second level is HAVO. So like I told you before, that takes five years. And after the third year, the students have to choose a profile. And there's four profiles, and the same applies to uh, VWO. And so the first profile is uh, culture and society, and then there's economics and society, science and health, and science and technology. So the, um, they all have to follow some um, subjects that are compulsory for everyone. So in um, in VWO, they, uh, everyone has to study some type of math, but uh, there's, to make it more confusing, four types of math, or one or more geometry, and one is more um, algebra, and combinations of those. And Dutch is uh, compulsory in English, and uh, for VWO, you also have to follow another language, which is often French or German, but when they go to um, gymnasium, then it's Latin and ancient Greek. Some schools offer uh, Spanish or Arabic or Chinese. So that is also something you could ask to the school and see uh, what they offer. And uh, science and health and science and technology profiles, they are more uh, for students who want to become a doctor, for example. And uh, so it. it by then, by the third year, um, they should know more or less what they want to become, or at least what they want to study afterwards. There are ways, so if you realize later that you want to become a doctor, but you didn't uh, choose biology, uh, that you can um, take an exam and study by yourself, but that is, that's pretty hard. So uh, it would be nice if the students chooses right uh, at the first try in a third year. So they get some um, support with that through the school. And uh, But it's important to, as a parent, to regularly talk about this. Do you have any idea? Maybe uh, you want to talk with people who have different professions and then ask them what they uh, want to become. At my um, older son's school, uh, they organize an afternoon for uh, parents of uh, students at the school to come in and talk about their professions. So to help the first year students uh, to choose a profile so they can ask questions. So, OK, what profile did you choose? But at our time it was different, but just to help them uh, with the process and to make them aware of the different kinds of uh, 
professions that exist because yeah, a lot of students they have no idea, of course. And um, in the end, the students have to take an exam at the end of uh, HAVO. So this is an exam, so the only exam in uh, Dutch education uh, officially. And in HAVO they have to take uh, seven subjects. And apart from that, uh, physical education is uh, compulsory and um, world orientation and religious schools. They also teach uh, religion and they can decide themselves in which way they do that. And they also have to teach uh, some type of music and drama and some other uh, drawing and other subjects, but they are not uh, included in the exam subjects. There are some exceptions, so if your child is very musical and they want to take their final exam in music, but then it's also music theory and they have to perform a piece of music, then there are a few schools that offer that as well. And the same with arts and crafts and drawing. So for those special subjects, you really have to ask the school specifically. Then some schools also teach uh, psychology or philosophy. Um, so if your child is interested in that, you can try and see if uh, if you can find it. But that is not compulsory for the university later. So it's nice to have, but it's not that if you didn't study psychology in uh, high school that you cannot go to university anymore to study psychology. Um, so after half a day, they prepare for University of Applied Sciences, but it's also common to go to uh, VWO afterwards or to uh, MBO. So there's still many options after that. Uh, VWO, so like I said, they have two branches, Atheneum and Gymnasium. The difference is that at Gymnasium they teach uh, Latin and Ancient Greek and so the classical studies. And that's also a common question. Um, do, does my child have to go to gymnasium? Uh, I would say uh, only choose for gymnasium if they really like the classics, if they really like the Greek and Lat uh, Roman mythology, the old stories, if they like to translate, because it's a lot um, translating of texts from Greek or Latin into Dutch. So for a student who is not native Dutch, it can be extra difficult because if you don't know the Dutch word, then you get a lower grade. But so it's a bit of a puzzle sometimes and some students really like that. But if they're not interested in that, then don't do it because it means often extra hours in school, extra hours of homework, extra subjects. So they really have to be up for it. There's no study in university that requires gymnasium. So they can still become a doctor without uh, knowing Latin. Of course, it helps when they know Latin, but it's not a requirement. And if they want to become a teacher of Greek and Latin, maybe it's handy to have studied at gymnasium. But yeah, that's uh, one of the few exceptions. And uh, there are some schools that are only gymnasium schools, so standalone gymnasium schools, or in Dutch, categoraal gymnasium. And before you choose that type of school, you really have to be sure that that's good for your child. Because if they don't like Latin or Greek anymore, they have to leave the school. If it's too difficult, there's no lower level, so they have to leave the school. If they fail the first year, they have to leave the school. So it's very important uh, that they know what they are doing. But if that's what they like, it's perfect. So uh, um, go for it. There are also some schools that offer mixed levels and then gymnasium is one of them. So the advantage of that is that they can choose uh, later if they want to go to gymnasium or not. And if not, then they can stay at the same school and then uh, do Atheneum instead. There's uh, a lot of uh, schools that combine different levels that uh, only start with gymnasium in the second year. Uh, but that also depends on the school. 
So the first year is just VWO, and then towards the end of the first year, they ask the students, okay, um, we'll do some trial classes for Latin and Greek. Uh, are you interested? Yes. Okay, then you can go to gymnasium. If not, then you uh, go to Ateneum. So that depends again on the school. And then some schools, they have additional subjects instead of Greek and Latin. So, uh, for example, philosophy or debate or things like that. So that's another thing that you have to look into. So sometimes gymnasium means extra hours, but not always. So that also differs per school. Uh, then there's also technasium. Maybe you've heard of that term as well. And uh, some people think that is technical. That's a bit how the name sounds like. But it's actually more um, research and design. And they work on projects that are commissioned by uh, real companies or institutes. And so it's a lot about project work, creating things, doing research, what is needed and by whom, and uh, finding a solution to the problem. And some schools offer technasium at VWO level or HAFO level and a few also at uh, VMBO T level. Um, so that's another thing. If your child is interested in that, could be a good option. Uh, if not, also fine. In the end, you get the VWO diploma, so you don't get a gymnasium diploma, but they give an additional certificate that says, okay, gymnasium. And they will have eight exam subjects in VWO. So one more compared to HAFO. That's also good to realize. And it is also important to know that uh, the secondary schools, they don't care which primary school a child has attended. And the universities, they don't care which uh, secondary school uh, a student has attended. So they, um, there's a few university studies that select uh, their students because they are oversubscribed. But in most cases, you apply for the university you're interested in and then you get a place. So there's no entrance exam. Uh, they don't look at your grades. They just look at do you have the right diploma? And in some cases, do you have the right profile? Um, a few studies like medicine, they are always subscribed and then they can have an assessment or they look at uh, side jobs that a student has done or interviews. So each university can decide how they do the selection and that changes very often. So by the time your child is in that uh, process, it will be different again. But I know in some other countries, it really matters which a secondary school you have attended and you only can go to the best one and a lot of camp competition, but that's not the case here. So in most uh, situations, no one cares about the grades. Uh, provided you have passed the year. So you have to have a um, sufficient grade, which is a five and a half. And in most cases, that's enough to go to the next year and to graduate. So we've already talked a bit about the professions. Uh, this is uh, what you could think of. Of course, there's many more professions, but just to give you an idea. So with the MBO diploma, uh, a student can become an assistant with a lot of different types of assistant, a secretary, security officer, installation technician, woodworker, hairdresser, nurse, child minor. So it's a lot, thing, a lot of things that they do with their hands or very practical. So for some students, they're just not very interested in academics and then they can still do something they like and become good at it and get a good diploma in that. Um, HBO, uh, like I said, is comparable to University of Applied Sciences. So in a lot of countries, there's no distinction between HBO and universities, just called university. But you'll see a lot of professions uh, for you need a HBO uh, study for that. So teacher, accountant, manager, team leader, um, banker, architect, art director, journalist, translator, estate agent, advisor, engineer, so ING, abbreviation, consultant, midwife, artist, pilot. So that, those are all um, HBO uh, studies. Some of those studies are also at research university, but then there will be 
more academic or more analytical. So there's a lot of variations as well. But typical uh, university studies are uh, to become a lawyer, psychologist, doctor, surgeon, specialist, expert, researcher, notary, professor, engineer, so IR, scientist, and many more. So just to give you some idea. Um, there's one option that not everyone knows about and also not all schools uh, know about, and that is COP class. And COP class is um, a year after primary school, so usually after group eight, but in some cases after group seven. And that's especially for children who are very motivated, good at math, but they're results are a bit lower because uh, of their Dutch. So it's mostly children who have uh, moved to the Netherlands at a later stage and they're not completely fluent yet. So COP class is one year and it's a very intensive Dutch at a high level with the idea to bring them to a higher level of education compared to the advice they got at the end of uh, group eight. And uh, so you have to start in the beginning of the year, so you cannot stream in mid-year or anything. And after COP class, they uh, start at the first year of secondary, so in one way they lose a year. But in, on the other hand, they usually start at a higher level, so they gain time compared to later. It's also important to know that uh, it's common that for COP class you have to apply earlier. There's often not enough places, so if you your child doesn't get a place then they still have to take part in a lottery for the regular schools. And in Amsterdam they have to apply before the 17th of February, so really keep that in mind. And uh, the COP class um, so at least in Amsterdam, they are located inside of a couple of secondary schools spread out over Amsterdam. And, uh, and they get priority in the lottery for the year after at the same school, but they can also go to any other school uh, if they want to. So you don't have to stay at that same school. Then another option is ISK. But that is more for newcomer students so who don't speak any Dutch yet. So for COP class, they expect already that you have finished Dutch primary school. So the Dutch needs to be at a good level, but not good enough, if that makes sense. ISK is really for uh, newcomers. Um, and there's two in, uh, in Amsterdam of uh, ISKs and other cities, they have their own. So if you think the advice my child got is lower than I expected, lower than they are capable of. And with a bit more push for Dutch, they could go to a higher level school. Then maybe they are a good candidate for COP class. So definitely talk about it with your child's teacher. Yeah, the differences with primary school. And so my oldest son is in the second year now, so I've already gone through this. And a lot is changing. And so prepare yourself. Um, the whole school environment will change. Your child will change. They, they grow up, they enter puberty. They will do things in a different way than you had expected and hoped for. Uh, they are suddenly the youngest of the school instead of the oldest of the whole school when they were in group eight. Um, they become much more independent. Uh, there's a lot more independency and autonomy expected from the school. So they have to do a lot of things by themselves that not every child is capable of. So maybe you want to help them a bit in the beginning. And it's common to cycle to school. So parents usually don't bring their uh, secondary students anymore. That's uh, very uncool. And uh, they don't want you to, their friends to see you as a parent anymore, so stay away. Um, the secondary schools, they're usually much bigger than the primary schools. It can be very overwhelming. It also depends on the layout of the school, how they deal with that. So my uh, son, my oldest son attends um, a top sport class at the Kalland Lyceum in the West. 
in Amsterdam and uh, that's uh, the bigger school of Amsterdam. So first I was a bit like, okay, wow. But what they do is they have a separate entrance from, for the first and second year students. They have their own canteen. So they don't really feel that it's a huge school and that there's many uh, children who are already 16 or 17 or even 18 because they go to another section of the school. They also have most of their classes at the, at their wing. So it's it's pretty yeah, safe and, and small in that sense. And then at the uh, end of the school year, they open the wall um, uh, of the canteen. And then it turns out that there's the rest of the school and the canteen of the older year students is attached to the first and second year canteen, but usually the wall is closed, so they don't know about that. So that's especially for the second year students to realize, okay, next year we'll be at the bigger part of the school. And um, I really like that. So in that way, it's much less overwhelming and it, it looks smaller than it actually is. But it also depends on the school how they deal with that. Another thing that's very different is that uh, your relationship with the secondary school will be much more remote and distant. Um, you don't walk in with your child anymore or talk to the teacher. It's common that you uh, have uh, contact with the mentor. So the mentor is uh, one of the teachers and they, um, they are responsible for one or a few classes. And so they, uh, the students see this teacher for, for example, math class and then also for mentor hour. And during mentor hour, they, uh, they talk about the group dynamics, if everyone is happy, if, if anything is happening. Um, and they also spend time on how to study, uh, how to make a summary, how to do your homework uh, and all that kind of things. Uh, for some students that is enough, other students need more help with that. So some schools, they organize uh, free homework support after school. Others, uh, you have to pay for the homework su uh, support, but it takes place at school. And again, other schools, it's up to you what to arrange, but nothing is offered at school. So also that is a difference. And uh, they also... Um, yeah, the, your child will be hanging out with other children that most of them you will not get to see anymore, which is also very different from primary school. And also the parents of their friends, <laughs> that's completely vague. So what I did was um, I collected the uh, phone numbers of uh, the best friends of my son and I made a WhatsApp group. And I said, OK, we have a WhatsApp group now, we will need each other. So we arrange things together or when we have a question or something, then it's easy to reach the other parents. But that's just with uh, three friends and their parents. But that definitely helps because otherwise you don't really uh, get to see them uh, anymore. Uh, they will invite you for a parent meeting every now and then. So then you can uh, get to meet some other parents as well. But yeah, there's much less communication than you are used to. Um, most schools, they have a, a parent portal. So the students, they have a portal and there they can see their homework and their grades and their schedule and everything. And then they have a special parent uh, version for that. And um, you have some extra rights as a parent. So you can, uh, when your child is sick or has to go to the dentist, then you can um inform the school about that the students don't have this uh, option they wish they would have have it but no um then another thing is that they uh they have trips sometimes abroad especially in the higher years without parents or they uh, have a camp so it's common to have a, a bridge class camp to get to know each other so for a few nights somewhere in the netherlands uh, they have excursions. It could also be that your child has to be at a certain time in different area than where the school is. 
Um, so a lot of things they have to arrange or make it work. Um, and if you li already live far from school and the activity takes place at the other side, then yeah, how do they get there? Um, so there's a lot of practical questions you will ask yourself as well <laughs> in that time. Um, they have many different subjects, especially in the first year. So in the third, uh, after the third year, they choose a profile and they have fewer subjects. But in the beginning, they really have a lot of subjects. For every subject, they have different books. Um, so that can be very heavy. So a lot of schools, they have lockers and then uh, you could put uh, half of the books so for the afternoon you put in your locker and then you switch uh, later and then you get those books and put the morning books. But that requires a lot of organization and um, packing your bag. So <laughs> tip for me, let your child pack their bag an evening before and not the morning uh, before they go to school, especially in the beginning. And a lot of schools, they work with iPads or uh, laptops, and then they need to bring that to school as well, and it needs to be charged. And so they really need to think of all the steps they have to take and to bring everything. And in most cases, uh, they have a specialist uh, teacher for each subject. Uh, some schools, they don't, teach the subject separately, but they combine it. So in a theme or a project, so then uh, it's not uh, geography and history uh, separate, but maybe combined. So that is an option as well. And then you get uh, some subject names you have never heard of, but then you should ask, OK, is this a combination of other subjects? It's also common that the teachers stay in their own classroom and the students, they move from one classroom to the next. So when it's a big school, often they get lost in the beginning. So they often have a trial day and then they learn how the building works and where they have to get to. And, um, but some schools, especially in the first year, the teachers come to the class instead of the other way around. Of course, it doesn't work with PE and uh, music and uh, arts and crafts, but for the other subjects uh, that could work. Or like at my son's school, all the classrooms that they need are close by, so it's the same wing. So it really depends on how the, uh, the school organizes that. Then um, for almost every subject, they will get homework. In most schools in primary uh, school, they don't give a lot of homework, but that's really different in secondary school. And during the mentor hour, they will talk about how to do your homework, but that doesn't come automatically for a lot of children. So really check if they have understood the con concept and if they know what to do. And still my uh, second year son, I still need to help him with that. Um, especially for subjects he's not very interested in. So if it depends on him, he only wants to play football. Um, but like history, it's really like all those old information and um, I don't need that. He still dreams to become a professional football player and then you don't need history and math and all those other subjects. I think a bit differently about that. But then I really have to help him and motivate him. And so, yeah, this looks like a big pile of history information that you need to learn. But if you cut it in smaller pieces, then it becomes a bit easier. And there's a lot of uh, YouTube videos of people who are very generous and explain a lot of things. Um, they also follow the book. So if you know which book uh, your child is uh, studying, so the schools can choose uh, which uh, methods they use. So there's usually um, three to four, maybe five, depends on subject, uh, of uh, different uh, met methods of, uh, of subjects. And then the school chooses the method that they think uh, suits them best. And then you go to YouTube and you find instruction videos where someone talks about the most important things. 
follows the book and uh, of course that's not replacing uh, doing homework and learning for tests, but at least it helps. And it becomes a bit more interesting that way. Um, and then, uh, so your child will come home with a schedule, but every day it can uh, be different. So it's different subjects. Uh, sometimes they have uh, five hours per day, maybe next day they have seven hours. Uh, so it really changes and then uh, usually three times per year they change the schedule. So uh, if you're not at home during the day, then your child really needs to have a key so they can uh, come in by themselves. And another tip, um, make good arrangement with your child what they can do during that time that they're home by themselves and check on that because being by themselves and puberty and having freedom that sometimes doesn't go well together but it really depends on, on the child and how serious they are about school and, and um, so be prepared that they will come home at different times every day and then um, unfortunately uh, a lot of schools they suffer from teacher shortage especially in the bigger cities and um, and it depends a bit on the school how they deal with that. So some schools have substitute teachers, but there's also shortage of that. Uh, sometimes it's one teacher who takes over two classes, which yeah, they do have class, but it's not ideal. Sometimes they give online uh, lessons. Uh, sometimes they say, okay, there's no German class, but all students uh, stay at school and they do their homework. Or sometimes they say, OK, you're free to go wherever and good luck and be back at this time. So that's called uh, uur, so in between hour. So all those things could happen. And some schools, they have uh, special rules for the first years. They are not allowed to leave the premises during school hours, for example. Other schools don't have that, so then they will go to the supermarket or the snack bar nearby school. So also agree with your child how often they may do that, how much they can spend there, uh, who's paying for that, uh, because all those things are new to them. So they, they really want to try out all those things. Um, unlike primary schools, most secondary schools have a canteen. Uh, usually they don't serve uh, hot meals, but uh, sandwiches and soup and uh, some snacks and things. Uh, that is a question that uh, usually the children ask when they visit the school at the open day. What do they sell in the canteen? And then they especially look for unhealthy things, while most parents look for healthy things. So that's interesting discussion as well. And uh, so really, um, yeah, Keep track of what your child is doing, uh, what they need help with, and also how much they accept help. So uh, personally, I noticed that my son really needed help, especially how to answer uh, test questions. Some things I thought were obvious for him, he had no idea. Um, so when he was asked what's the difference between A and B, he just said, yeah, A has this. And then he had half of the points and he didn't understand why, because that was correct. I said, yeah, but what about B? You didn't mention B in your answer. Yeah, no, B doesn't have that. So yeah, but you have to write that down. And I had bought a lot of uh, notebooks for him. And then I asked him, so, okay, are you taking notes during class? When you do your homework, are you reviewing your notes? When you learn for a test, are you looking at your notes? Yeah. And then after a few weeks, it turned out he had one notebook for all the subjects together. So page one, history, page two, math, page three, Dutch. And I was like, no, how? But for him, he had no idea that, that after a few weeks, you have no overview anymore where your notes are. And you will never find them back anymore. But those things you really have to explain. And um, and then, yeah, being explained those things by your parents is not cool. So it's often a bit of um, 
a fight sometimes. Uh, so now we decided to hire a tutor um, because he didn't start this year very well. Um, and I found a 60 year old boy who can help with math and yeah, they really connect. They both play football and they talk about other things as well. And so then it becomes a bit easier and it's not uh, the role of the parent anymore to explain those things. But some other friends uh, of my son, they they're very punctual and very serious about studying. And now my son is serious as well, but there's more fun things. And so how to study, that's a bit difficult for him. So every child is different and uh, yeah, keep uh, keep that in mind. If you want to read more about uh, puberty and you can read Dutch, I have this um, book that I can recommend by Kluun. Uh, it is in Dutch, but it's called uh, Help Ik Heb Een Puber. And it's very uh, fun way about, uh, about all the different types of uh, uh, children in puberty and the different parent roles. So I would definitely recommend that. It's funny, but also very informational. Um, there's a lot more to tell about this phase, but because of the time, I'll uh, I'll move on. Um, I saw a question coming in, but I cannot see it anymore. I'll pick it up uh, later when I can find it. Um, there are some things that uh, secondary schools have in common. So they all have um, obligatory subjects that they have to teach. They all have the minimum amount of um, hours that they uh, have to teach. So for four years of VMBO, uh, total is 3,700 hours. And for six years of VWO, it's 5,700 hours. So that averages 20 to 30 hours per week. And it always includes at least two hours of uh, physical education and a minimum of 45 minutes uh, uh, break time per day. So um, that is what they have in common. Uh, a VWO diploma is a VWO diploma, so it's not worth more when you go to one school or another school. And they all have to uh, offer the profiles, but it can be that they have more focus on one profile than the other. So that is different. But in the end, um, they uh, um, they have to follow uh, the core objectives, as they are called. So the government has established the uh, requirements for every school, for every year, for every level. Um, then uh, all schools, uh, yeah. I think almost all schools, they give grades. Uh, I can hold a separate webinar about grading because that's also very uh, different. Um, very short, uh, they don't look at uh, competition in the class. So it's not like, oh, it's best of the class or top 10% or anything. Um, but the teacher decides uh, uh, how important a test is. So, uh, smaller tests I maybe count once and bigger tests count uh, three times, for example. And then they can see, OK, um, this is pretty easy test. So every mistake, I uh, take away one point, for example, one grade. Um, and when it's very difficult, they can say, OK, um, you can make uh, five mistakes and then you still have a nine. So it's one out of ten. Um, so it's not a percentage. So that's a short version. Uh, I'm sure you'll have questions about that later. And um, and all this information they uh, they publish in a parent portal and a student portal. So most common portals are Magister, some today or Zermelo, but there are others. But make sure you have the login details that you put it on your phone immediately and that your child does the same because you will miss a lot of essential information if you don't. All the schools ask for uh, voluntarily a parental contribution. 
so the same uh, idea as the primary schools, so to pay for extra things, excursions, uh, art materials, things like that. Um, it's usually higher in secondary schools, so uh, it's common between 400 and 600 euros. And parents who cannot afford that, they can ask the municipality for a subsidy. Um, so it is voluntarily, but the school needs that to organize those extra things, school parties and uh, stuff are also included. Um, you're talking about school parties, that also depends on the school. So that's also a good question to ask. And uh, now because of uh, Corona, of course, a lot of things have been canceled. Uh, some schools picked it up again, others they yeah, they don't care anymore. They forgot about the parties. Often it's more for the higher uh, grades that they have a school party. Um, but it is also common that they go. So my son goes uh, ice skating in a few weeks with his class and then with all the second year students. So all those things they, uh, they organize and pay by the uh, parent contribution. It's also common to have a student council. And uh, so they um, represent their uh, fellow students and they discuss with management about things that they would like to see improved. And also depends on the school how active the student council is. Uh, yeah, we've already talked a bit about the subjects. Uh, so here you have the, the list. So this is for the lower grades. Um, and then uh, so some schools, they teach every subject separately and others, they uh, combine different subjects. Uh, but in the end, they have to teach all these materials. Um, in the end, there are 58 uh, core objectives or attainment targets uh, in Dutch Kerndoelen, and that is what all schools have to adhere to. And the, the inspection, they, checks, uh, they check if every uh, core objective has been covered. So they can name it differently and teach it in different order or different uh, number of hours. But in the end, this all has to be covered by every school. Um, then the differences between the schools, and there's a lot as well. Uh, it sounds a bit strange maybe, but um, school hour means different things at different schools. So uh, some schools, they have a school hour that is 60 minutes, but some have uh, 45 minutes and then it's a different class or 50 or 60 or 70. Um, some schools, they have uh, what they call um, block uur, which is uh, uh, two hours attached to each other. So for the same subject and often they can also do a bit of their homework already in the second part. And some schools, they teach uh, in day parts. So then um, they really go deep into the materials, uh, but then they have that subject only uh, once per week, for example. So that really depends on the school. Uh, some schools are very um, heavy on laptop or iPad and others are more uh, book oriented. Um, so that is something you have to look into and see what you prefer or not. It's common even with the uh, schools that use laptop and iPad a lot that they have workbooks. So the children still have paper books and have to write, but learning they do from a screen and doing uh, on paper or other ways to, uh, to uh, produce what they've learned. Um, this is definitely a good question to ask when you visit the school. By the way, I'm making a checklist for uh, secondary schools and I will send it to you when it's done. So you can use that uh, when visiting the school and uh, uh, asking uh, all those questions. Um, a lot of schools, they have some, uh, what they have different names for, but in the end, it's a few hours per week that the students can decide themselves how they uh, spend it. They have to do something, they cannot just uh, take off. But they, for example, can go um, to attend a class by a different teacher when they didn't understand something well, or they can do additional subject, 
or they can um, uh, sing in a choir or make music or play extra sports or um, so that's often called keuzewerktijd or Dalton uur when it's Dalton school or M uur when it's uh, uh, Montessori school but in the end it's all the same thing and in that way they, the children can be exposed to some additional subjects as well um, some schools they have uh, fast lane English or Cambridge English and they can take an additional exam for that and, uh, and get the certificate uh, some schools also have Goethe for German and Dell for uh, friends, French um, so that is maybe nice if um, if you uh, if your child is interested in that. Um, some schools are um, bigger and they have more facilities, and others they are uh, um, are smaller and they don't have that much facilities. So also that is uh, varies per school. Also the after school activities that they offer, the extra subjects. Um, population of the schools is different. It also depends on where the school is located. There is no uh, neighborhood priority anymore. So the students, they can apply for any school in the city and sometimes also outside. So I see that some of you live in Amstelveen and then you can choose if you want to go to school in Amsterdam or Amstelveen. So you don't have to stay in the same uh, municipality. Uh, some schools are based on uh, religion, although most of them are not really religious anymore uh, and open to students who are not religious, but also that varies per school. Um, you still have, like in primary school, the Dalton, Montessori, Waldorf schools. Uh, you don't have to have a primary Montessori school to go to primary, uh, secondary Montessori school can have some advantages, but it's not necessary. And in Amsterdam from this year, you don't get priority anymore. Um, so for a, a primary school, you used to get priority if it was the same concept, so Montessori, Adult and Waldorf, but not anymore. So now there's more chance for other students to go to the uh, Montessori school, Adult school, Waldorf school, if they want. Um, some schools, they're more modern, new buildings, everything still smells fresh. Other schools have been around for more than 100 years. They're more traditional, different atmosphere. So especially what does your child like? Because they have to go there every day. You already have your high school diploma, I think. So it's it's really where the child feels more comfortable. Um, and... Um, and some schools, they do offer all the levels, but then maybe VWO is very small or VMBO is very small. Um, so also see how many students per level they offer. And the same applies for special needs support. All schools need to provide some uh, special needs support, but some have more experience in a certain area than others. Um, so it's always good to ask the school uh, what they can offer your child if they have some uh, special needs. Uh, if same with primary schools, if the special needs are um, complicated or very um, severe, then there is also a special needs uh, secondary schools. And yeah, the application goes uh, separately uh, from the main lottery. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, number of pupils, that's a very big difference. So this is uh, about Amsterdam. So the smallest school is uh, Gaider, that's an uh, Orthodox Jewish school. And uh, so they're very small. And the biggest school is where my uh, son goes to. So there's a lot of variation. Um, advantages of bigger schools are that they have uh, more facilities, also after school activities, they have uh, specialized teachers, in not only for subjects, but also for um, special needs or other things that they are uh, uh, expert in. And um, often they can 
uh, offer more subjects and so there's more choice for the students and they're often part of different uh, connections networks uh, so they they're often schools are part of a bigger school board and they can do a lot of things together um, and often uh, so in case of a lottery like in Amsterdam a bigger school can place more students, but they can also move around a bit. So if they suddenly get more half of students and they're expected, then they can maybe take some uh, seats away from the VMBO and put them in half of, for example. When it's a smaller school, that doesn't work. Um, but there's also advantages of smaller schools. It's more personal. Everyone knows everyone else. It's easier to find your way and not get lost. Um, easier to manage. Uh, it's often smaller classes, but not always. So you can also have a small school with full classes. So that's also something you should ask. And um, so, yeah, make sure that you you're, get the feeling of what your child prefers, where they feel comfortable, and if they offer what your child needs. Other things you could... Uh, yeah, you should maybe, I should say, uh, look at uh, so what levels they offer, offer, especially if your child has um, a combined advice. Um, so uh, ask how they uh, compose their uh, Brugklas uh, for the first year, or if they maybe have uh, a Brugklas that takes two or three years. And, and then it, if they combine different uh, levels, also ask how they do that. So at my son's school, so he's in a combined half a VWO class uh, for the second year, it, it is combined. Maybe also the third year, but that depends yeah, if the students already know what they want to do or if it's uh, still uncertain for some yet. So they're very flexible in that, which I also like. They say they teach at uh, VWO level, but then they test at half a level. And then for students who uh, are pretty sure they want to go to VWO afterwards, they add some more difficult questions that are sort of optional. But from the VWO students, it is expected that they will also complete those questions. And he often gets two grades, so one half a grade and one VWO grade, and then the half a grade is higher. So you need to complete more questions correctly to get a higher grade for VWO. Um, but every school does that differently, so ask them how they deal with the combined uh, class. So for the Amsterdam lottery form, uh, you will only get to see the schools that offer the level of your child's advice. And if it's a combined level, then you will see uh, schools that offer both. So when you have a half o slash VWO advice, you cannot apply to a school that only offers VWO, so they have to offer both levels. And then some schools, they allow the student to choose if they want to go to the higher level or the lower level. Some they only offer the lower level and others they combine it in the first one, two or three years. So that really varies per school. So you have a lot of questions to ask uh, when you visit the school. And that's why the school visits are so important. Location of the school is important as well. Not only the neighborhood, but also um, how is the route from your house to the school? Is it safe? Is it uh, easy to cycle for your child? If it really rains or storms or snows, is there public transport option? Uh, all those things uh, you should take into uh, consideration as well. Uh, then you could also look at uh, the profiles that they offer, the additional subjects, uh, after school activities, uh, length of the school hour. So I was talking with my son about the uh, double hour. So <laughs> I think it's nice because then you have more time to digest and to really work on that. But he said, no, I prefer just after one hour to change subjects because then I can keep my con concentration. Otherwise, it's too long, it gets too boring, and then I lose my focus. So, okay, that's an interesting way to look at it too. Yeah, so there's a lot of things uh, you should ask at the open day. Then also look at the uh, inspection reports. Um, 
most schools in Amsterdam and in the Netherlands in general, they uh, they have positive reports. So they get uh, audited about once every four years and the inspectors have a very long checklist and they look at the results, but also things like uh, teacher turnover, maintenance of the building, uh, complaints from the neighborhood and everything else. In most cases, uh, it's okay. Um, you can check that via the link that I uh, added. So it's all in Dutch, but um, green means that it's good. Orange means that they found a few things that were not really good. And then red is um, that it's uh, serious issues and they have to improve on them. If they don't, then they risk to be closed. So that's very serious. Um, maybe you have uh, received from your child uh, the keuze gids. Uh, you'll find a lot of information about the schools in there. This is from Amsterdam. Every municipality has uh, their own guide. Another thing I want to say about the standalone gymnasium schools versus the schools that offer multiple levels. Uh, on the one hand, a standalone gymnasium school is very nice. They so the whole school follows gymnasium. They do a lot of extra things for Greek and Latin and classics and, and with the whole school. And uh, some of those schools have a long tradition and they do a lot of yeah, traditional celebrations and things. Personally, I prefer a uh, gymnasium together with other levels. So for the students, if they don't manage uh, gymnasium or if they are done with it. So I went to gymnasium and then I was done uh, with Greek and Latin at some point and then I just dropped it. But you cannot do that at a standalone gymnasium school. And I also find it important that children of different levels are mixed, that they become friends, that they see each other in school and that they're not isolated in separate schools. Um, so the school my son attends, they have a lot of uh, Turkish Moroccan children, which I really like. He has learned a lot about uh, Ramadan and uh, other celebrations and uh, the whole school was cheering when uh, Morocco was playing at the World Cup last year. I think that's an enrichment for him and it's very personal how you think about that. So this is for the Amsterdam lottery. Uh, some other places like The Hague, Haarlem, they also have a lottery. Absolvein is also a sort of lottery, but then with fewer schools. Um, so in Amsterdam, everything is online and uh, you will get the email from uh, Elk. Keep an eye on uh, for this email address when your child is in group eight now. You have to apply between March uh, 6th and 16th and it doesn't matter uh, when you apply. So you have equal chance uh, if you apply on uh, March 6th or on the 16th. But make sure you apply before the deadline because Otherwise, you only have the leftover schools you can choose from. The form is called the uh, AMELD formulier, so also keep an eye on that uh, in your mailbox. And also check your spam folders if you didn't get it, because you really need to get this email. It has all information and your login details and everything you need. Um, so like I said, for half and VWO, you need to rank 12 schools in order of your preference. And um, some schools, they offer uh, different streams. So, for example, Technasium and regular school. And then if you put both of them, then you have to find a 13th school. So it has to be 12 different schools. Uh, for VMBOT, it's six schools. And for uh, BNK, uh, four schools. Then all students, they get uh, allocated a random lottery number that you only get to see at the same time that you see the school where your child has been placed. And uh, all children, they get a guaranteed place at one of the schools that they have listed. And like I said, there's no priority anymore for Dalton Montessori Walder School, which is good news for children who come from other types of schools, but bad news for children who come from those concept schools and they wanted to go to secondary school. Uh, the outcome is on the 17th of uh, April. And um, 
there are some organizations that provide more information. Uh, the VSA, the Stichting Vrije Schoolkeuze, uh, that's a group of parents and they uh, they try to make the system more uh, fair for everyone because yeah, it's it works, but it's not ideal. And for some children, they get a very low school on their list. Um, and OSVO is sort of umbrella organization that uh, organizes the lottery. So in February, we'll talk about this uh, more in detail. Last year, they had 7,779 group eight pupils that took part in the lottery. Uh, there were many more places available at the 75 schools in Amsterdam, so there is enough place. However, some schools are more popular than others. And so a lot of schools, when you put at school number one, you get a place there. But especially if your lottery number is bad and it's a popular school at number one, then you get a, you have the chance that you go lower down your list. Um, they have a procedure called uh, improvement of the tail. That means that um, children who got a place at the number nine to 12 or for VMBO at uh, the last three spots, um, that they look at the worst lottery numbers and then try and place them at the school higher on the list. So they will ask the most popular schools to create 4% more places. And so with a bad lottery number, you still have a chance to go to a school higher on your list. Um, so in that sense, worst lottery number is when you are somewhere in the middle, but you don't know that in advance. So you have no idea where you will uh, end up on the list. And there's some strategy behind how to rank the schools. Um, in the past years, the most oversubscribed schools were Fons Vite, Metis, uh, Lumion, Spinoza and Barleus. Um, Metis is Montessori, Spinoza is Dalton. They gave priority to children from the same type of primary school. So the chances will change again. So it's a bit hard to predict how that will be. But last year, uh, 78.4% got uh, their number one school, 93.7 in the top three and 97.7 in the top five. Um, so that is pretty good. But of course, when you were one of the 27 children that got a place at school number nine to 12, in uh, reality, no one got number 12 and only one child got number 11. But then you are not happy. So overall, it works well, but there's always some sad stories. So if you want to make sure that your child gets the number one school, then you should put the school on that place uh, where the chances are pretty good to to get it. So that's uh, what happened with my son's school. He only wanted sports and the school has a um, top sport class and they can usually place everyone. So. Uh, I don't even know which schools I put on number two to 12. That was funny for us, but um, but he had to take an extra test uh, before he could enter the top sports class. And that is uh, what I mean with the profile classes. So like Metis, they have uh, Technasium and um, Coder class with programming. And you have to put it separately on the list and then you need an extra school. Um, some uh, schools, so like IFCO, uh, they have uh, that's art uh, profile school and the students need to do uh, make a portfolio or do a selection. And that takes place before the lottery. You can only take part in the lottery if you have passed the assessments. So that is something to uh, be aware of as well. Um, some parents asked about uh, twins, so there's no sibling priority anymore in secondary schools. Um, so if you just fill out the same list for both your twins, it can be that they end up at different schools because of the lottery. If you really want them to attend the same school, then you should pick a school at number one that uh, is usually not oversubscribed. 
um, the specialty schools, that is uh, what I meant by the, uh, um, the IFCO, and there's a school for uh, catering and hotel and restaurant services. So they have, uh, they are offered the levels, so the same subjects as other schools with a level, but then they have some special classes uh, on top of that. What's also important is the hardship clause, and that's what not all parents know of. So if your child has a specific reason to go to a specific school and it really needs to be serious, um, but for example, so I know of a child who has uh, serious allergies and uh, diabetes and some other things, and if something happens to him, then his mother needs to be able to go to school very quickly. So in that case, you can apply for the hardship clause and then you get a guaranteed place at that school without taking part in the lottery. But that's only for a few children. It's about 2% of the available places at the school that they can offer through the hardship clause. Uh, so you really have to build a case uh, yeah, long time in advance and provide the documentation and really, um, yeah, fight for it sometimes. Make sure that they understand why their school and not another school. So you really have to think about that. Uh, Amstelveen, yeah, that uh, became a bit more difficult for people living in Amstelveen uh, because Previously, they could take part in both the Amsterdam and the Amstelveen uh, lottery, but now that um, the period is the same for uh, the whole country, uh, you have to choose. So you can still take part in the Amsterdam lottery, but yeah, not anymore in Amstelveen. And it can be that the school your child will end up in the Amsterdam lottery is pretty far from Amstelveen. So, there's also nice schools in Amstelveen, so maybe stick there, I think. Um, yeah, homework, support and tutors. Um, for a lot of children, that's not needed. Others, they uh, cannot survive without. First, ask the mentor if your child needs more support. Um, and then is it especially for a specific subject that they need support with or more overall study skills or how to do your homework? Um, I can provide you some uh, references to tutors that I've used myself. Some of you asked uh, if we can change schools after the first year. Um, in theory, you can, but in practice, a lot of schools are full. So they're full through the lottery and then first the child has to leave before they can offer a place to a new student. Um, it's often also if they have a place and someone from the ISK applies, then they get priority because they have to change schools. They cannot stay at the ISK if they are fluent in Dutch. They often also give priority for students who move from out of town. Um, so it can be difficult to change schools after the first year. You uh, there's no procedure, so you you have to call each school separately and ask if you can change. And uh, often they only know towards the end of the school year if there will be students who will repeat a year or skip a year, maybe. Um, so yeah, you shouldn't start too early, but also not too late. But try to arrange in the school year, so before the summer vacation to start after the summer vacation. Some parents try to change once the school year had started and that's even more difficult. And really explain why you want to change and why their school and yeah, you have to insist. So yeah, it's not uh, easy. And these are more resources. So first uh, I listed a few articles and videos that I've made and then some other sources. So OCO is a um, consumer organization for in, of education. So for parents in Amsterdam with questions about uh, education, it's a free service. Um, they answer your questions, but they cannot do much more because they're all volunteers. 
Yeah, so it's uh, a lot of information. In the end, uh, it's about your child. So see what they are capable of, what they are interested in, but it's too overwhelming for them. So I would recommend make a pre-selection as a parent and then sign your child up for the open days um, that of the schools that you like. Make the ranking of the schools together. Um, if your child really has a preference for one specific school, that's fine, but they have to be aware that there is a fair chance that they will end up at another school, so manage their expectations. And in the end, most children, they end up at a school that maybe they didn't choose for in their top ranking, but most of the time they they are happy after a while anyway. So try and get over the initial disappointment and uh, and make the best of it. That would be my advice. So this is your last chance to uh, answer, ask questions. And uh, yeah, thank you for attending. I get a lot of nice uh, messages now. And uh, if you have any other questions, then uh, I've made a special uh, package for secondary schools. So if you click on uh, on this link, uh, it's on the families page on my website and then secondary, then uh, we can talk more about the schools in your city or town and uh, based on the level of advice that your child got. So that's a more personal uh, consult. And uh, I can also accompany you on the, um, the school visits if you want. So there's a lot of uh, possibilities. But maybe with this presentation and the other resources that are mentioned, uh, you have enough information and you can go ahead by yourself. So up to you. Whatever you do, good luck with everything. Prepare yourself well. It is complicated. It is a lot. So keep track of all the schools you visited. Write down immediately the pros and cons, what you liked and didn't like, because otherwise you will get confused and uh, mix them up. And in the end, it's out of your control because of the lottery, so it will be okay. Okay, then uh, we'll close it here and then uh, I wish you a good night. And maybe we'll see each other at the school arena or at the other open day. So if you recognize me, then uh, just uh, come to me and we can have a chat. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.